Hello, and welcome to the Woodshed Podcast. I'm your host, Andy Brent, and I got some exciting news. I just got some new audio interface, so my audio should be crisp. Our intro today is done by our featured guest, who I'll introduce soon. But our outro today is done by the Strawberry Republic, otherwise known as Shogunai's, or simply uh, Behrouz. He's uh, actually edited this episode, mixed the episode, and basically did it in record time. So I'm extremely thankful for him, and his music's pretty great. The tune that we'll play at the end is MRCN. It's from mostly an experimental album he did, but the drum work on the album is amazing. I absolutely adore it. If you like animals as leaders or like Tool, I mean, just like a little bit of Tool, but really animals as leaders is what I hear the most. It really is in that pool of music. It's really great. Um, Go check them out. Give them some love. Very excited. Um, I'm joined by uh, Race today. Say hi, Race. Hi. Um, Unfortunately, Donnie and Lee, Donnie Lee, couldn't make it. Um, for this interview, but they sent me, um, some questions, or Lee did, uh, Donnie just said K, but we'll see him again some other time when we do another interview. All right, so we have a very special guest with us here today from the Concord Blue Devils, uh, (laughs) plays synth, I believe, keys. Uh, his father hosts an amazing radio show named Fat Tracks, uh, (laughs) The world famous. It's Garrison Goodwin. Yeah, world famous. Hello. Ooh, give it up. Give it up. Just hello. Thank you. Uh, us two here. Yeah. So why don't you uh, introduce yourself? Yeah. Hi. Yeah. So uh, I'm Garrison. It's it's really awesome to be here. Thank you to Andy uh, and Lee specifically too for helping me uh, come on the podcast. Ooh. It's pretty cool. I'm I'm pretty excited to be here. I've, I've like always wanted to to be on a podcast and be able to just like chill and talk about stuff that like I'm interested in with other people so I'm I'm really excited for this um for people who are uh just getting to know me I was born in Southern California I've pretty much grown up here all my life I did marching band in high school I did jazz band in middle school and high school for eight years I play piano I went to school in Arizona for two years at NAU after that, I kind of realized it wasn't exactly where I needed to be in my life. And now I'm back home in SoCal going to school and trying to get into Cal Poly Pomona to do their music industry degree. And I'm um, still playing piano, even after sadly aging out from the Concord Blue Devils. But I was a part of drum corps for three years, and I'm just finishing my last winter season with a RCC indoor percussion. So I'm, I'm looking forward to that. And uh, yeah, it's just a little bit about myself. Yeah. I'm very excited. For people that didn't know, I'm a marching band guy. I fortunately uh, don't do DS, uh, DSI, the DCI. I always wish I did. I regret it now. But I'm in my final year at my college's band, the Golden Buffalo Marching Band. Woo! Um, highly recommend it. Yeah, so my first question is, I'm really interested in, uh, do you actually like your dad's music? <laughs> that That is a question I, I get a lot. And I actually do uh, like my dad's music. Some people, you know, I, I've heard a lot of different opinions about, you know, my dad's music. Cause I, I do think it's very like, um, unique, you know, like he has a very specific writing style. The thing I'm most impressed by my dad's writing is how anytime I listen to like a piece without knowing like who the composer was or like, you know, what the title of it is, I can still tell whether or not it's my dad you know, just because I've been around it for so long and he has like a extremely unique writing style. And I, so I actually do, you know, really enjoy his music. I think some of my favorite songs are um, his arrangement of Green Dolphin Street, that single came, he came out with. That's actually, <laughs> that's actually, one, of, that's actually one of my favorites, uh, along with his arrangement of uh, Rap City in Blue. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I, as always, ironically love Jazz Police. You know, it's still just as, still just as, I, I don't know what, I don't know what else to say about Jazz Police, man, you know. Wait, so how old are you again, Garrison? I just turned 22 last month. Holy shit, dude, I'm 22 too. Nice. Wow. When's your birthday? Except I turned 22 in July, so a little bit ago. How's 22 so far? Pretty good, you know, about the same. Uh... <laughs> Been, uh, I'm always the youngest. Been playing some gigs, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> That's good to hear. That's good. We were laughing because uh, Ray said right before we got on asked for 
uh, a copy of Green Dolphin Street. <laughs> I think I like your dad's music. Like, I played it in high school, mm-hmm. and I think that's part of the issue of what I'm going to say next. But, like, <laughs> I played uh, How Does Song Go uh, and High Maintenance, and I mm. still really like High Maintenance yeah. a lot. Yeah, High Maintenance is a good one. High Maintenance is a good one. But it's like, I feel like a lot of the people that don't like your dad's music um, are, well, for me at least, it's like, oh, yeah, I love that music, but I played it in high school. And it's just got, it's always has that tag on it. Like, oh mm-hmm. yeah, it's that music I played in high school. Even though it's like, yeah. you know, a super dumbed down version. Like yeah. I'm playing an octave, <laughs> two octaves below Arturo Sandoval. Yeah. And I, yeah, I think that's, that's one of the things that some people don't realize all the time is that, you know, my dad, yeah, like he, a lot of his charts get published by Alfred. Yeah. And um, a lot, a lot of people like have made arrangements of my dad's music. And I've heard, I've heard so many bad arrangements of jazz police, um, (laughs) that I could, I could, I could make a list for you, but you know, I think it, that you could look at that tag as a, as a bad thing or, or as a good thing. And like, I guess on a glass side full kind of way looking at it, I think that my dad's music being so popular with that like age group of like high schoolers and middle schoolers, um, is like a really important age group to like get kids kids excited about jazz, like to get them excited about like playing music. Mm-hmm. And I think because they have like that, my dad's music has that sort of like attachment to that like age group. I think mm-hmm. it's really I think it's really cool how people kind of associate that, you know. But I do see how you're saying that some people are like, okay, that's like high school. That's like I played that in high school, and now I'm into more like you know, free, more like modal out there stuff that's not as, you know, structured, Mm -hmm. you know. It was definitely like my, some of my favorite music I played in high school. It's just, especially the tunes we played were just super high energy. Yeah. And yeah, I think it's great for high schools to play. Um, It's just, it's just fun music. The funny thing is, is we didn't play, well, at least my high school, we didn't play any uh, Gordon Goodwin at all. We mostly played like Sammy Nestico and stuff like that. (laughs) <laughs> but I didn't know about Gordon Goodwin until college, and we played we've played so much Gordon Goodwin, and like wow, <laughs> at really? least at my at my school, uh, pretty much everybody in the jazz bands like super classical music guy mm-hmm. people whatever. So they don't mm-hmm. really listen to jazz very much, so it's like perfect for them too, because it's almost like the like you were saying the high school thing where it kind of gets them into it and yeah, usually high energy. So it's kind of cool, but. I can see where the other people are coming from that are like, eh, that's high school music. Yeah. Not it, real jazz. I don't know what yeah. You know, I mean, I've, I mean, my dad told me this story one time where he was giving a, he was giving a clinic at a high school and he wasn't the only person there. He was a judge, I think too. And he was, oh, okay. he was on after another clinician and he was in the, like the amphitheater where the clinician it was being held, where they had the show and he was sitting in the audience and one of the students in the band raised his hand and they were talking about like arranging or some specific thing. I don't remember what, but basically one of the students raised their hand and asked him what he thinks about my dad's music. He's like, what do you think about Gordon Goodwin? And like he had a microphone because it was like a live clinician. It was like one of those things. Mm. And so he's like, oh, we don't really listen to that Disney jazz here. And he, <laughs> and he called, he called Wait, my who, he called my dad's. I, I don't remember who, probably. I, I also I think. Oh, it's probably good we don't say. Their yeah, name it's probably good. Yeah, my oh, dad. My, yeah, da- sorry. my dad would probably get mad if I if I said his name, or her. but you. Know, <laughs> I I always yeah like I think the the fact that he 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 cleverly thought of my dad's kind of music as like a Disney jazz as if that's like a insult in a way. I don't know. I feel like a lot of great jazz music has come from Disney. You know. Yeah. Like. Yeah. That's, yeah, yeah. that's I don't know. So. You know, people are going to have their opinions. I don't listen to that. He's like a Wynton Marcellus. <laughs> it was probably Wynton Marcellus. He's like, we don't listen We don't listen to that Disney jazz. We don't listen to any of that fusion-y stuff. Get out of here with that Disney jazz. <laughs> Gotta get back to our roots. Yeah, honestly, a lot of, if there's any, if there's any, like, crowd that probably gives my, my dad the most shit, it's probably, like, that, that East Coast, like, mm. old school, old school, you know, like, Coltrane like bandstand shed vibes you know where it's like if you can't if you can't get up there and shed on your instrument you know you're you're like 
they don't care. Yeah, 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 true. You can't play bop. Get out of here. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, I've always, I don't know, at least for me, your dad's music has always been uh, kind of like gotten me into listening a lot more. I don't know, I've always found it really, really fun and enjoyable to play. So mm. at least when it comes down to it for me, is if it's fun and enjoyable to play and listen to, like, I don't yeah. care how it really sounds. <laughs> Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> I mean, if you're well, this is like the the interview we had with Dave Pollock. If you're just like playing the music and you're not having fun, why are you playing it in the first place? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Literally. Yeah. I mean, well, at least earlier today, I was trying to practice giant steps, and I was like, "This isn't even that fun. Like, <laughs> why do people <laughs> like this?" Dude, dude, I've had that. I've had that. That that like thought so many times. And yeah. it, it, it took me a long time to like realize that, you know, like I don't, I don't have to go into jazz. Like if I don't want to, like I can still yeah. do music, but I don't have to just specifically try to make it as a jazz musician, you know, mm-hmm. cause, cause that angle, like as, as much as some people are like really passionate about that, like I've definitely learned in my lifetime that like, that's just not for me, you know, like I love music and I love like, being able to to play with other people and having the ability to do that honestly is a blessing of its own. Yeah. But, you know, I I'm under the belief that if you're not having fun while playing the music or if you're not enjoying like what you're playing then like why are you doing it? Yeah. You know. Well, I mean, part of it too is, you know, obviously you're not going to have fun with something that you're not the most comfortable on, so sometimes you just need to like suck it up and get used to the Yeah. You know what I'm trying to say? Like, put in the work and, like, try and get used to it. And then you can have fun. But s- still, sometimes the process is more unfun than it is, like... Yeah, I think I think there's a difference between going out of your comfort zone to, like, learning something new or, like, hearing something and feeling, like, past that, you know? Mm, okay, yeah. Like, hearing, like, a really simple pop song, you know, on the radio that's, like, top, top 10 hits or whatever and, like... You know, it's like, I mean, I'm not saying all top 10 music is garbage, but, you know, like, you, you, you find the most, you know, like, produced thing out there, and it's like, if, if you can get by playing that, if you have fun playing that, then, like, why, you know, who am I to stop you, you know? If that's really, like, what you feel. Yeah, recently I've been trying to study, like, you know, I'm trying to get through all these people I'm, quote unquote, supposed to listen to, like, these trumpet players, because I, I used to be really, like non-contemporary i listen to everyone that's already dead and you know i so i'm trying to like catch up on everything but it's like i'm a lot of the time i'm just not in the mood for it and it's like i like the music but i'm just not in the mood Mm -hmm. lately it's been like man i just need those crunchy nowhere beats (laughs) yeah i I just been listening to that non-stop you said you liked your dad's music but like what is your kind of go-to music like that you like to play that is uh that i like to play or that i like to listen to both uh we can do both yeah both um i mean uh it's funny i've done three summers with drum corps and you know in terms of the the music i'd say i would not say that was probably the most fun i've had performance wise because the the music i would have for drum corps it's not challenging in the same ways like jazz challenges your your knowledge of theory Mm -hmm. you know or classical challenges your chops you know drum corps really challenges your your rhythmic timing and your ear you know more often than not. So I'd say the most fun I probably have playing would, I'd say I, I really enjoy playing like jazz fusion yeah. charts and I've really gone and in, gone into learning um, like standards and my friends and I, you know, I've just gone through this huge phase this past year where I'm just like really into Kendrick Lamar. Mm. And I know, that, and I know that <laughs> that's like, good, that's yeah. not like, that's not outright jazz, but like I, I listened to, to Pima Butterfly for the first time last summer and it like, blew my mind when I was like really intently listening and now you know now we're like trying to do my friends and I are all trying to like hip-hop synthesize our our, like whatever we play with our instruments and it's that's been a really fun experiment that's super cool yeah and you know that translates towards my listening where like obviously the music I'm listening to right now um in terms of jazz I've gotten back into Victor Wooten Mm -hmm. really recently actually because I, I looked up that 1998 video of him playing "You Can't Hold No Groove" if you don't got no pocket, and that that uh, it's like a 10 minute video of Victor Wooten playing a bass solo. I've I've listened to that like a hundred times in a row. I can't get enough of that tune. It's crazy 
I haven't seen that video, but I saw Victor Wooten live at the Dakota in uh, Minneapolis. Oh, that's awesome. And it was like, it, I, th- I didn't really know Victor Wooten at all. Uh, just my bass buddy wanted to go see him, and I was like, sure, I'll go. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I thought it'd be like a combo or something. It was literally just him and a drummer, and it was like yeah. so fucking awesome. It's crazy how much he, he like fills in the space of like all the frequencies that aren't there, even though he's just a bass player. Yeah, it's insane. And like like he didn't even have the drummer out for like the first like twenty minutes. He was just like playing by himself. And he had like a loop pedal too, which is like and he's like, Yeah, I just got this big loop pedal and uh, <laughs> I don't know, I'm just kind of experimenting with it. Jesus Christ, this guy is insane. Yeah, he's 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 crazy. I love him. I've always been a long time fan of um Stevie Wonder. Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh just like from a from like a so- first like from a songwriting style, like I wish I knew how to like construct, you know, chord progressions like that man does. Mm-hmm. Uh I've I've been listening to a lot of Chet Baker too. Oh yeah, Chetty. Back but back when Chet Baker was younger, not not old Chet Baker. Oh okay. Oh, I I you said you like jazz fusion. I thought you'd like the later Chet Baker, where he kind of got into that. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, <laughs> I remember I had him on shuffle on Spotify when I was driving one time, and I th- I don't remember what it was called. All I remember that it was a version on his album called a Butter Remix. <laughs> I don't know what that is. I've never heard of that. <laughs> Dude, it was like really, it was really weird. It was just like a, it was like a hip hop beat over Chet <laughs> playing some like really a, a tonal stuff. Oh, that is, I really want to know where that is now. That sounds like my shit. It's uh, called the Butter Remix. Yeah. Check it out from Chet Baker. <laughs> the Butter Remix. The Butter Remix. Here, I'll find the album. It's on the album Love for Sale. It's a live album. All right, let's let's go on to another topic. Um. So one question that Lee had um, that I'm going to kind of fuse into my own was, um, what was it like growing up in your dad's household? Was there like a lot of pressure to perform music and was like their pressure to like specifically go into jazz? Yeah. Um, you know, growing up, I have, I have a brother and a sister, um, love them both to death. Uh, my brother's it's about six or seven years older than me. My sister is about nine years older than me. Um, I remember when I turned six, and so relative ages at that time, my dad forced my whole me, my brother, and my sister to all start doing piano lessons. Like we were all going to take piano lessons once a week, and we we didn't really have a say in it because he knew that it would be a, like a beneficial investment for us as kids mm-hmm. like going to the future. Us as as kids at that time didn't really like know that, and so we were obviously like very against it. We were like, "Oh, we don't want to practice," like, eh, you know. And so my sister, my sister, my brother, and I started piano lessons. And first, my sister quit and went to singing. Then my brother quit and he went to saxophone. Then later picked up electric bass, and now he plays electric bass. And I, um, I wanted to quit piano too, but I didn't want to pick another instrument. And so basically my dad said, you don't get to quit piano until you either find a a different activity you want to do or you pick a different instrument. Does that include non-musical activities? That included uh, like sports, swimming, you know, like game development, like anything. Something you can be passionate in, something like that. Yeah, because my dad, my dad would never not support me, you know, for whatever I wanted to go into. But it was very clear that he, he definitely had like an idea. You know, like he, he definitely was pushing, pushing me like in that direction, you know, like, of course that would make him happy, you know, but basically, uh, if I started piano, I was six, uh, the first 12 years I played piano, I, I hated it. I, I absolutely hated it. It was, it was pretty, it was pretty, I, I, I don't mean to be like dramatic, but I, it was, it was rough trying to get me to practice as a kid. And I think it was because I think it, it there was a certain pressure, you know, because like that's the first thing, like when you when you're going to in a music event, you know, because because he's my dad and like he'll he will take me to his gigs sometimes and I'll meet like the band and I'll meet, you know, all these really good musicians. And the first thing that they asked me about was like, oh, so you're so you're Gordon's kid, you know? Oh, so you're, you know, so when are you gonna take the band or when are, when are you gonna start writing? Jeez. You know? Oh my that's god! A you know, and and I hate to I hate to like come on a podcast and be like, oh, like, woe is me. My, my dad's a, a 
semi successful jazz musician, you know, in, in the jazz world. Oh no, this is juicy. You know, I, I like it. <laughs> yeah, like I hate to I hate to, you know, sound like I don't appreciate what I have because I because I do. I really appreciate my dad. He like he's done so much for me. And I I, mm. I, I like I feel like I'm I will be forever in debt um to him for all he's all he's helped me do. But uh growing up there was this certain atmosphere of like focusing on music and jazz specifically, at least for me, you know, and as, as I've gotten older, you know, I've become more independent and I've started to, to kind of discover, you know, like I like, I enjoy jazz. I enjoy listening to jazz. I enjoy playing jazz, but as a career, I don't, that's, I don't think that's what I want, you know, in my life. I want to do other things. And I think like finding that, taking the time to like find and accept that has really helped me, um, kind of progress as a musician a lot faster is like figuring out my goal, what I wanted to be, help me figure out how to get there a lot faster, which sounds obvious, but sometimes people, you know, sometimes people can lose sight of that. So I have a question too. You might be able to answer this. I don't know. Go for it. Um, I'm just curious since you've met a lot of his band members, who's like one of the nicest people that you've met that's in his band? The nicest Oh, in the big fat band? The nicest person? Yeah. Yeah. I was going to ask the meanest, but I feel like that wouldn't be <laughs> yeah. fair. Uh, I mean, I mean, the, honestly, the meanest is harder. Um, <laughs> the meanest? No, my dad. no. My, my dad's not. He can, my dad, my dad can, 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 he knows how to push their buttons, but he's not outwardly mean. Uh, I'd say the nicest guy, probably be, yeah. and, oh, you know what? Andrew Sinowick, hands down, nicest guy. Mm. Andrew Sinewick, the guitar player, super, he's kind of young, but dude, that guy can shred. I love that. I love that guy. So, does he has he ever had to like fire anybody from the band or anything or like Um I'm just kind of curious how that huge professional band goes cuz you'd think everybody would be like perfect and they wouldn't actually have to really work on stuff. <laughs> yeah, they don't they don't rehearse often, that's for sure. Um a lot of the times, you know, my dad when he is preparing an album will have maybe like one or two rehearsal sessions where everyone comes into LA and they, they run, they just like do a run through of each tune. And I, I've, I sat in on one of their uh, recording sessions for that's how we roll when I was in high school and dude, they, the way those guys can make it sound like their sight reading is like the easiest thing in the world to them. It's crazy. Jeez. I have ne- I have never seen like a level of musician where uh, like 12, 15 plus people in a room can all just start, like grab their instruments, go into a room and just like play like extremely tight, you know, on the first try so well. Like, ob- and then like, you know, obviously there's gonna be like a little mental flub here and there, but like for like, they like, it was like grade A professional musicianship in there. Like it's, it's crazy how good they are at sight reading. Yeah. Especially like, with my dad's charts of how like how complicated my my dad's charts can be rhythmically yeah that's one thing like when i would listen to the reference recordings whenever we would get one of the tunes in in jazz band like i mean obviously everything nowadays is like edited to some degree uh Mm -hmm. but like that was one of the things that i really noticed is like everything was so freaking tight yeah you know playing wise it's just like yeah, I've always noticed that. It's just so... Mm-hmm. When I was going through high school, um, especially my first band director, just had an entire collection of just, like, every good one chart. And uh, he, he always was like, gosh, you guys need to be tighter. This, you don't <laughs> sound like the band ask. at all. I'm like... <laughs> We don't sound like a band, <laughs> don't sound like a band at all because we're not we're not fucking superstars. But well, that's a lot to ask. Yeah, it was always real tight. It was a good learning experience, definitely. I think you mentioned this, but did you ever play your dad's music in high school? I've played my dad's music literally throughout my entire musical career. Starting in middle school, he wrote an original chart for our middle school group called "Hit the Bricks." Super easy D minor. I feel like I've heard that. It's like a super easy like. D minor blues bass line with like mm. funk you know it, it's like super easy middle school music and so we played a couple of his like arrangements in middle school but I didn't play him that much in middle school but when I got to high school that's when I started playing a lot more uh we played Sen- his arrangement of Send Your Mouse mm-hmm. uh I I had to learn On Green Dolphin Street his arrangement of that uh Hit the Ground Running was another popular one that I had to learn uh how does song go was a fun one. I, I I really enjoy how does song go. 
I, and actually my studio jazz band in high school uh, played Rap City in Blue for like our spring concert. And that was, that was just like crazy. You know, like that was such a surreal experience. I played that last spring and that chart's fucking awesome. <laughs> right? I love that, that trombone solo, dude, that gets me every time. Andy, Andy Martin's tone is so good. Yeah. What was it like playing, like with the other high schoolers? Like how they treat you being his son and then playing his music? Was there any interesting stuff that happened there where they're like, oh, why aren't you playing it <laughs> perfectly when it's your dad's music on the first <laughs> yeah, time? I mean, or, I've, I've definitely you know. gotten some, some, like, there's definitely a lot of jokes I've heard all the same of, you know, where it's like, oh, does your dad like force you to practice every, every night and all that stuff where, you know, but, um, the, I mean, the other kids in high school, they, they all knew, but to be perfectly honest, um, like in high school, I, I wasn't as good as the best student there. And a lot, I wasn't, I was not as good as a lot of students there. And at the time I was really kind of like self-conscious about that. And so, you know, I don't think nobody ever like outwardly said something to me about like my playing but you know I I definitely like looking back at it now like I can definitely remember like I I was not that good in high school until like maybe the end of my senior year that's when I started to get like a little I started to pick up a little bit more and I started to kind of understand things a little bit more and then when and then when Mm. I went to college that's when I I started to learn a lot more but in that area I had a lot of I had a lot of people, you know, kind of question, you know, my commitment to music. And I think I question, I was questioning myself, honestly, you know, every day when I was in high school, I was like, man, like, why am I doing this? And, you know, like, why, why do I keep coming back to this jazz band where like, I don't feel like I, I'm doing well. And like, I don't, people don't like playing with me because I don't feel like I'm doing a good enough job. And it, it's just like a such, it's just that uncomfortable situation. Um, the, the motivation I used to get through that was marching band because uh, in marching band, it was less about, you know, how you played your instrument and how good you were. It was more about like the kind of the person you were. And I think, and I think I Mm. attached to that really quickly when I went to high school and marching band became like a really safe home for me. And so honestly, it's probably why I'm still playing piano now and why I will still continue to play piano. It's because I was able to use, a positive like motivator to get me through something that was tough for me. And I'm really glad I, I did because, you know, if I, I, I'm really glad I didn't quit because I wanted to quit so many times. There were so many times I, I, I told my dad I wanted to quit or I told my mom or I told my friends or my, my band director. And, you know, my, my dad never, never let up. He never let me quit. And I'm, I'm really thankful for that. All honesty, I'm like super thankful that he never let me quit. That's crazy. It's it's just cool to hear about the whole marching band thing too, especially because where I'm from, we don't have marching bands at all because we live mm. in North Dakota and it's yeah. very cold and we would only get to march like the first week yeah. of school. <laughs> but yeah. yeah, that's I don't know. It's it's always been kind of an enigma to me, like why anybody would want to do marching <laughs> yeah, band. It, it, no, you're right. It's 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 stupid. Don't do it. No, don't 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 <laughs> yeah. do drum corps. Well, I mean, but you still got something like a lot out of it. So I don't know. It's just cool to hear yeah, that. Yeah. Yeah. For me, it was always make working with my friends and my other fellow musicians very, very hard and going through just mm-hmm. rigorous stuff. Like I remember in high school, if a bee landed on you, you didn't even move. Like you just let that fucker sting you. Because you're you were in the marching band, you're <laughs> supposed to be cool. You're supposed to be you're supposed to have this mindset where no nothing there's, can phase you. No yet. fun allowed. And I just it always felt felt good after a performance to just know we made something like that. Especially when you're in like you know these higher mm-hmm. uh, competitive bands, and you you know you're like oh yeah I I I feel good about this. Like I I know I look cool or whatever, and. I just loved making a product like that. And uh, the band I'm in now, the marching band, is much yeah, more laid back. fun. But, I mean, it's 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 instead of, like, making, like, a perfect product, it's more about, ins- well, we say inspire <laughs> inspiring the children or getting the fans, you know, going crazy. And that's always a great thing as yeah, well. Yeah, definitely. I, I think, 
I think marching band definitely like, you know, is viewed diff- through like a different scope that I think musicians view like the jazz world and classical, you know, definitely. Yeah. But, but uh, I, you know, I don't think that's unwarranted, you know, like there's definitely a diff like a different purpose to the activity, you know, like obviously to push the art form and to make it what it is, but to, to provide like that home for, for kids who wouldn't otherwise have that place. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've, uh, another question. So what do you remember like growing up in your house, like really at an early age, like was your dad always like playing music around you or like, <laughs> cause I'm just trying to think of like what parenting styles are. Cause some people like, like to try and play as much music around their kid as they can or is, I don't know, I'm just wondering what the exposure level was like at an early age. Uh, well, it, it definitely started very young. Uh, the earliest m- memory I have is we had this uh, CD of like, um, oh, what was it? It was like a CD of like a play or something that had like Beethoven's music in it. And my, and like I listened to that CD every night for like, like, months when I was like really really little you know and they would play music at night you know because they because you know isn't that a thing where like parents think that if you play classical music for their yeah, babies that it'll yeah. make you smarter or something or like they hold headphones up to your like pregnant wife's belly uh, I, yeah <laughs> ah, kind of like, the Mozart effect yeah. <laughs> this is my this is where exactly. this is my department where my my professor just ranted about how wrong that was all right, lay down the law, <laughs> that, Andy. <laughs> that's a whole complicated discussion, and that that gets into more yeah. science yeah. than music. Uh, but anyway, go on. Okay. I su- I support it. Yeah, you, you should be able to play music to your stomach if you want to. You should have that right in America. You deserve you deserve that. <laughs> um, but yeah. And then right out of the womb, you yeah, should be you able to transcribe it. it. <laughs> you go back. In. <laughs> no, 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 you don't do that. No, 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 that's bad. That's bad. <laughs> Shut your head back in there. Um, uh, are, do you mean like what type of music they like played for me, or like? Yeah, I guess. You know? Yeah, was there like a bias? I guess. Or were they trying to make you look? <laughs> oh, they were. I mean, my dad like definitely all. had uh, specific opinions about um, what we listened to. This was before my time, but my my brother and my sister always told me about how when they were growing up. And the Marshall Mathers uh, LP came out like way back in the day when that thing came out. My my brother, and my sister would like fight over that CD. Like they they were, they would like try to listen to it more than the other person. And my and when my and when my dad um, realized they were listening to that Eminem uh, LP, he he was like really like okay you gotta imagine this was this was like okay what what year did the Marshall Mathers LP come out was it two thousand I, I wouldn't remember. know yeah yeah I was, we were all very I was young. Really young but like it was definitely like two thousand right so this is like a different time where like you know parent like I feel like people were like were like less used to like hip hop music and like a abra- and like abrasive mm-hmm. hip hop music is that so my dad would like listen to these songs and be like this is like unacceptable. You could, you cannot listen to this. Like I, I forbid you to, to listening to this music. And he, he was, he was not having, having it. And I also remember a time where I actually, um, I actually took uh, dance classes for uh, a long period of my life. Oh, hell yeah. Nice. Cause my mom was a dancer and uh, she did like jazz and hip hop and ballet and stuff like that. And so I started doing hip hop when I was like six, six or seven and then when I got to high school, I had to choose between doing hip hop or doing marching band. So I had to, I, I chose marching band, which I, I don't regret. But um, I remember I had to listen to this Black Eyed Peas song for dance class. And it was, it was the one where they said, let's get started. Like that one. Oh, yeah. And, and my, I remember yeah, yeah. my dad being like, why are you listening to this song? Like I was listening to it on iTunes, like old school iTunes back in the day. And I was practicing my, I was practicing my dance oh, routine yes. and my dad walked in and he was like, what are you doing? Like, why are you, why are you listening to this song? Like you should not be listening to this song. <laughs> this is inappropriate. And so he, so he was like, he, he was pretty against it. Just imagine him like taking the CD out of the computer, throwing it and just like putting in some jazz. You know, there was <laughs> my dad would it. do this one thing. Both my dad and my brother would do this one thing where they would like, they would put an artist on the like this the radio or the sound system or whatever we were using at the time and we would sit down for dinner and my dad would look at me and be like okay who is this and he'd play an album and like you know 
as like a kid, you know, you don't really like listen to jazz that much because like you, your attention span is just like all over the place. Like you don't have, like you, you're you're not smart yeah, yeah. enough to understand like why. I mean, I, I don't want to say that middle schoolers aren't smart enough because I there's definitely I've definitely seen middle schoolers who are better than me, but that's not what I'm saying. Um, the the point of what I'm saying is that like when you're developing as a human, you know, you you have different tastes, and so your tastes develop. And mm. you know, I just didn't want to listen to jazz. So when he, whenever he would ask me like, like, okay, who is this? Who's playing piano? I'd be like, uh, like, I don't know. And you know, like, he would always like, kind of like, I always feel bad about that, you know, like growing up. Cause I, cause I would almost never know unless we've like gone over it before with me, you know, he never really gave me lessons or anything, you know, like I had private teachers and I took lessons, but you know, my, my, the most my dad would do would, would come and sit and play with me, you know, every so often just to see, just to like check in, but he never gave me like private lessons or anything. I don't know. You just, you'd, you'd almost assume that if your parent had already played, they would just give you free lessons to save money or something. But yeah. I do, I do understand like wanting to get a different teacher in there or something. Yeah. I, I think it, I think it was, it was probably for the best because he was he was always pretty busy, you know. When I was still taking when oh, I was still yeah, taking true. lessons, he was he was pretty busy writing for for other stuff, you know. Besides the fat band. So I know your dad also plays the saxophone, right? <laughs> yes, he does. He plays tenor. Yeah, because well, actually, one of my uh, friends who graduated after my freshman year at my school, she actually got to sit in with a clinic with your dad. And he had his tenor out, and, like, I didn't even know he played tenor. And I'm just kind of curious, like, when he started that and, like, how serious he is about it. Because piano, he plays piano with the fat band, right? Well, tenor, I mean, technically, from, like, a timing standpoint, tenor is his main instrument. Mm, okay. Yeah, that's what I thought, too. Yeah, he, he's, he has been playing tenor. He played tenor throughout uh, middle school and high school. Well, I think he played alto, too. But... He mostly played saxophone, like like woodwind instruments, in high school and in college. He mainly started focusing on tenor, and that's when he started kind of picking up piano a little bit. But he actually took—I remember him telling me—he actually took a break for a long time, for like a span of like five or six years, where he didn't where he didn't play piano. He just played tenor, and then when he was getting into arranging and like writing, he he like you know it's it's good to have a piano basis, you know, and so he had to and so he had to kind of jump back into learning piano. Um, at a bit of an older age, you know, and he plays piano with a fat band and he plays tenor. Um, it just depends on like, like it just depends on like who's there and like who's subbing. But yeah, he 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 generally likes switching between the two for like fat band gigs. Um, what do you prefer? Like, do you like his playing more on tenor? Or do you like it more on piano? Hmm, I would probably have to say tenor, and that's no that's no diss on his piano skills, but I just. He definitely like. I'll definitely listen to some of his sol- like his charts and his solos, and I'll be like, "Man, like that's that's weird. Like I wouldn't have thought of that, you know. Like not not that that's like wrong, but you know how like, you when you listen to a soloist, you you kind of like try and put yourself in like that in their in, shoes in that situation. Like, you're like, think you hear what's next? Yeah, and, then, yeah. and like yeah. so like I'm going like I'm trying to go through it with him, you know. And so I did that with like my dad's solos, and and like sometimes I would I would be like, "Man, that's like." you know, kind of interesting how he did that, but I don't, I, I wouldn't really do it the same way, you know, but with his tenor, I think like his tenor playing, I feel like he's like a lot more confident with that. Like when he plays tenor, I feel like he, he like really like kind of owns it a lot more. Wow. I actually, I'm happy I asked that question because I always thought he was more of a piano dude for some reason. So are most of the tenor souls on the recording him then? Uh, they're not all him. Um, I'm pretty sure uh, on Rippin' and Runnin', the saxophone battle is between him and... Oh, I don't want to mess this up. I want to say Eric Marienthal, but... <laughs> he has you listen to yeah. it. He's like, who's the saxophonist? <laughs> Who is he, it? He, no, he's, Who is he's it? done that. He, he has literally done that, driving on the way to school in the morning at like seven in the morning. He'll he'll be like, hey, it's a daily routine. Yeah, he'll be like, he would be like, hey, do you want to do you want to listen to my new album? I'd be like, yeah, sure, dad. And then he'd put on <laughs> this song, and he, he put he put on ripping and running, and when it started, the sax uh, bandstand like kind of solo 
dual thing. He was like, okay, try to guess which one's me. And I, and I, and I had to get. <laughs> yeah, That's adorable. really cute. That's adorable. Yeah, I had to guess which one was my dad. You're, you're like wiping the crust away from your eyes. So yeah, like I, I, I have to go car. to. Like, I gotta, which one's me? I got to take an AP, AP Gov exam. And like in like an hour, yeah. my dad's <laughs> yeah. like, I don't have time to think about if you're Eric Marienthal or not. We, yeah, we have a lot of good moments like that. So he actually likes listening to his own music because I know a lot of artists don't actually like doing that. Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, he he definitely. I've talked to him before about like you know like what he thinks about his writing style and how people like kind of you know make make fun of his like very happy and very like always very energetic kind of writing. Mm-hmm. But you know, he like he the way he justifies it is that you know like it's just like what he writes. You know, like he can't that's he he can't explain it any other way. But it's just what he knows. Like it's what he feels. It's like it's the music that represents him on the page. You know. Yeah, totally. That I feel like he is just doing what he knows. You know, and whatever that turns out to be, you know, it is. And I think if I had to, if, you know, if I had to say like one, uh, like minor criticism of my dad's music and i feel okay saying this because because i've told him this before and we've talked about this because we talk about music sometimes is that i feel like sometimes <laughs> just sometimes like sometimes we can we can only talk for like uh like 30 minutes 45 minutes because because sometimes he'll he'll like say something that'll make me go like what like what are you talking about and then I'll, like i just don't want to talk about oh it. i see yeah he, you he, guys he, will get in like fights not really fights but like yeah not, not yeah. fights but we definitely disagree about like like, like about Kendrick is is one of those things too. Um, I I showed him I actually showed him for free, um, the second track onto Pimper Butterfly. Sorry, we're getting so off topic, but I showed him. No, no, it's all good. I don't know, this is on topic. I showed I showed him um, that the second track into Pimper Butterfly where Kendrick is doing the the just insane lyric bebop verses over the rhythm section, and mm-hmm. you know I and I remember like. Mm. The reason why my dad like not enjoying hip hop is because you know he he feels like it's too like easy. It's like really simple. It's just like oh, it's just a beat and it's just like a backering track loop and you just like shout over the chorus. And, you know, and I was like showing him this to be like, hey, like you know, there's this side of it too. You know, like there, like yeah, there's like the the easy version yeah. of that, just like there is with jazz, and but like there's this version with hip hop too. You know, and I think I think I'm I'm trying to oh. like broaden his horizons a little more, you know, by showing him stuff like that. I think, yeah. I think it's working too. He's starting to become a little bit more open to some of the stuff. Like I, I showed him, you know, I've been showing him like snarky puppy and, uh, Oh, what's the guy's name? Uh, oh, that's interesting. I feel like he would already know snarky puppy. I mean, he, he or have heard of him. He, ha- he has heard of them, but he, he hadn't really like done a lot of research on Listened. them. Yeah. Yeah, I, I like I like sat down with him and I like showed him the um I showed him Sleeper. Ooh, I just yeah. listened to that today. Yeah, Sleeper Sleeper's a really good one. And then I showed him Lingus too because that's like the stock stock go to one. Yeah, the go to one. You know. Yeah, the, I mean that. Yeah, of yeah, course. But he's 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 doing good. Well, did you say the critique that you were gonna say? Oh yeah, sorry. Uh, the, I guess the one critique I would have my dad's music is that um I guess like over the years I I think it. it for, for like me, I feel like your progression as an artist, like there has to be some, you know, sort of element of change and like develop and like development. Oh, and I, I think yeah. I, I've seen like very minor steps between each album of my dad's and like some like, you know, my favorite album is still Swinging by the Fences. Um, mm-hmm. The first one that by the fat band like that, that's still one of my favorites. And then That's How We Roll is my second favorite. But like throughout his journey, I feel like I feel like he could take a little bit more risks. You know, I feel like he's maybe acquired the foundation to be able to like maybe push the envelope a little bit more than like what he's already what he's done. Because going from that's how we roll to life in the bubble to me was like a very small step. Like I, I like those albums kind of like blend together for me a little bit. You know, and like the period of time they were released and like this like how similar they were. Yeah. No, I I definitely feel that. I I it's been a while since I listened to some like full yeah, good yeah, albums, too. but I I definitely yeah, understand same. what you're saying. 
I mean, a lot of people do like the consistency of, like, well, any artist, really. Some people get really butthurt when people really change. Yeah, like, I mean, yeah, that's true. I guess some people some people would prefer the latter. I used to listen to a lot of, like, Daft Punk and stuff, like, mm. earlier on in my electronic music phase in middle school. <laughs> yeah. And then when they came out with uh, Random Access yeah. Memories, like, so many people were so pissed off because yeah. it, wasn't, it wasn't the old, like electronic music that they used to have and it's more like kind of funky and like not really indie but like you know what i mean yeah okay okay i got a question for you guys what is what was your like guilty pleasure music in like middle school that was like admitted it like admittedly bad (laughs) but you still loved it did i have to know it was bad at the time well i mean it doesn't have to be bad i i guess that that's just (laughs) <laughs> I no, purposely no, no, no. listened no, 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 to no. shitty music not... when I was in. <laughs> I wasn't that ironic yet. We that ha- that I, no. hadn't become a thing yet. That's that's like now I listen to shitty no, music. No, that only purpose. the shitty music thing only applies to to me. But I, I want to hear I want to hear your guys' answers. I actually just started. Um, my whole iPhone got corrupted, so mm-hmm. I had to like redownload all my music, and it redownloaded like a lot of music from my middle school years, and it was all of this angsty angsty stuff like oh, three days grace yeah. uh, breaking benjamin yeah lincoln park seether um and gosh uh rise against <laughs> oh dude i i was totally a rise against guy yeah i was i was going through like three days grace and i was like uh mm. like this year i was like oh some of these songs are really good but like a majority of them are just I almost feel like the audio quality was just like clipping the entire time. I was like, man, I I was it was the stereotypical angsty teenager phase. Right, yeah. But I I mean I've always been a uh, I mean my first album my parents got me. Um, people can judge whether it's a good decision or not. But when I was like uh, seven years old was American Idiot. Nice. Uh, Green Day. And I still think that is the one of the best albums ever made. Really? But wow. I, uh, the, my, the point I'm making is I always listen to to different music. I was always into alternative. I never mm, listened yeah. to all that pop stuff, and that still kind of continued. I'm trying to make myself get into more pop stuff so I can actually listen to music with my friends, but I just I, I can't. Yeah. <laughs> For me, okay, the first thing that comes to mind, there's like a few things. At least uh, when I was growing up, like, music actually wasn't a huge par- portion of my life. I'm kind of like a late bloomer when it comes to music. Okay. Um, like, I never actually listened to my own music until, like, late middle school, beginning of high school. Because I never had, like, an iPhone, or I mean, an iPod or anything mm-hmm. to, like, listen to music to anyway. So I just didn't listen to music in general. But when I did start listening to music, I, like, <laughs> I... I really loved electronic music, and I really got into Skrillex like way before, oh. way before he got popular. Yeah, oh, that was I like freshman year for me. Popular on epic rap battles. Yeah, like like before, uh, what is it? Monsters and Sprites, whatever that song was. I I listened to. It's okay. The first song that got me into it was like called Duda Oliphant, I think, and I I it was in I think a YouTube video, um. I think it was this guy named My Chani, if you guys remember who that is, or have ever watched his videos. It, it like sounds kind of familiar. He's he's like this Asian dude from Australia. I think it was him. Anyway, the music is, was in one of his videos, and I was like, oh my god, what is that? It sounds so cool. So then I got into <laughs> this huge dubstep kick, and I'm, kind of, I'm the kind of guy who will like oh, listen to the yeah. same kind of music, and just that kind of music for like... A really long time oh okay. so I, I really got into that but like before that i listened to the same uh they might be giants cd anybody know them at all i never listened to them but they were popular around where i was they, it's like kind of like a kids band kind of like four kids i've never heard of them what, what are they called they might be giants they might be it's giants. they're really funny though like it's kind of like supposed to be like a funny kids music oh okay and I really, <laughs> I listened to that CD, like, forever. I also really like Flights of the Concords. I don't know if you guys know them. Nice. They had a show, too. Nice, Two nice. New Zealand dudes. Oh, yeah. But, yeah, my big thing was, like, way into dubstep. I wanted to be a DJ when I grew up. Yeah. I played DJ Hero the game, like, a lot. Oh, nice. <laughs> 
Yeah, I was really <laughs> fucking good at it, too. <laughs> I, I don't know. I've always been in instrumental music, and then I joined jazz band halfway through high school and mm. picked up saxophone and then really got into that, and that's all I've been listening to. So I've never been a huge fan of lyric songs or whatever, music. Songs with, like, lyrics or just, like, any, like, vocal? I mean, whenever I listen to music, I never listen to the lyrics. I always mm. listen to what's going Like, I, I don't, like really process lyrics or words in general when I'm listening to music. I'm always processing what's going on behind them. Like, I, that's, yeah. I really like hip-hop, too. Like, Kendrick Lamar, Chance the Rapper, Childish Gambino, yeah. Atmosphere, all these different guys. Uh, really like them just because I always like the instrumental beats because it's, like, groovy and stuff. And yeah. the rhythm of what they're rapping about. I never actually listen to, like, what they're saying, but oh. I really like the rhythm of it. Oh, that's like the best part of Kendrick's. That's that's like I know, the, that's, that's like the best part of Kendrick's parties. music. That's like I know it's funny. Because, at least for at least well, for Kendrick, this I don't know past about year. It. I've I've really like begun to realize that about myself. So I'm mm-hmm. starting to try and pay more attention to the words mm-hmm. and like actually listening to like Childish Gambino and Kendrick Kendrick Lamar. Like realizing what they talk about. Funny, but <laughs> anyway, that we can be done talking about that. Yeah. Yeah. I have I have two questions and they're vo- they're both very lighthearted. Uh, my first one is um, what what I'm sure you get this all the time, but like what are the best and worst puns you've heard with your name, your last name? Um. <laughs> well, like, I guess is, which ones are good win and which well, ones you are already, bad win? Well, you already well you already half nailed one. Uh, my <laughs> my seventh grade gym teacher uh, called me Garrison Bad Lose for most of uh, <laughs> the year. That's, that so, sounds exactly That's like a good me. one. I, so good that's or good bad, one. Depending, <laughs> on your, depending on your preference. Gar- Garrison, bad lose. Um, that's funny. I like that a lot. Uh, I've got... Yeah, that's a good one. I've, I've gotten a lot that. of Gary son. Uh, but actually, I, 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 I prefer to not be called Gary. Uh, Garrison is fine, or Gare Bear if you prefer. I guess if you want, <laughs> but I, I'm 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 mostly cool with Garrison, not Gary. Um, any other puns? Um, you, you see, I could have I I could call so many friends that are great with puns that and that I hate them for because I. Is it just like nonstop? Yeah, one of one of my friends, Amanda uh, Steinhauer. I marched with over last summer. Her, she was like super. She's so good with puns. Like she is so good with puns. And I generally have like a. I don't. I don't like hate puns, but there was definitely a time where if you said a pun to me and it was like bad enough, I would get like visibly like a, I would like look at you and get visibly upset <laughs> with what you said. <laughs> So uh, it's it's a bit of a it's a bit of a uh, a pet peeve I'm trying to get over, but but, but Gar- Garrison Bad Loose is definitely my favorite that's one. So good, <laughs> that's, that one's that. so good. That one's like modern too, like re- just saying the opposite of everything. That's like today's humor. That's 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 the meme. Lee wanted to ask, what is your dad's daddest habits? Oh man, um, his most dad habits. Yeah, his daddest habits. He wrote. He sent me. That's the exact words. Oh my gosh. Um, I mean, from the obvious, like, just dad jokes that are constant. My dad fancies himself a humorous guy, so he'll he'll crack. Yeah, I can tell. I can tell by video. watching that that <laughs> video of him talking about his radio show. I'll I'll link it. It's just weird. He he spends a lot of time in that office, cooped up. You know, he's just, that's like his only communication to the world is through that Instagram account. That's some shit I would do, honestly. (laughs) It reminded me of like Tim and Eric or like Eric Andre kind of humor. Oh my, I I absolutely love Eric Andre. Um, But the the most daddest thing my dad has ever done, I'll I'll do it word for word just just to be as accurate as possible. Um, So my dad... Um, whenever he calls me and I, you know, for whatever reason, can't come to the phone and he leaves a message, always loves to start his, uh, voicemails like this. He'll, he'll start like this. He'll be like, Hey Garrison, it's, uh, your dad, you know, the one who gave you life, who, who birthed you, who 
gave you gave you your very existence in this very moment. I'm trying to call you. Okay, bye. And then he would hang up and he would you just <laughs> he doesn't he would just, even say why. Yeah, yeah. He would yeah, just just voicemails like that where he's 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 committing to a joke super hard. Hundred percent commitment. I, I I respect that completely. <laughs> what a guy. Yeah, yeah, they're all yeah. Can't all be hitters. Can't all be home runs. <laughs> I love it. Um, how 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 fat are you? <laughs> how fat am I? <laughs> that was literally the first question I wrote down when I got ready for this interview. I thought that was the first question on the on that post you made in the ship posting group. Oh, was it? I I definitely read the comments on that one, uh, and I there was definitely some comments that made me raise my eyebrows a bit. I, I I don't even think I took any from there. It was just it's always a trash fire in that group, just like jazz. Hey, got him. Uh, to answer your question, though, how fat am I? I am, um, I am as fat as Wayne's cheeks. Mm. I don't know. That was just a bad trumpet joke. Wait, which Wayne? Which Wayne? I don't yeah. know which one you're talking about. You're you're the trumpet player, guess. Wait, oh Wayne. Shorter. Ber- Bergeron. Bergeron. I, I don't know how to say his <laughs> last name. I was thinking uh, my see when you say that I think shorter. Oh uh, yeah. Sorry, uh, yeah. I didn't. Sorry, I wasn't. You know what? That no, you know it was what? a good joke. Don't no, don't go back on it. It was a good it, joke. It was good. No, no, it was nope, good. nope, nope. Yep, went short. It yep. was good. You that's have it. to commit hundred percent. See that's yeah. See that's my problem. Um, I, I said I don't commit hundred percent. Okay, this is kind of like going back a little bit on the marching band thing. So, mm-hmm. you play synths then, right? For the marching band? Yeah. How does that work? How do you march with a keyboard? Do you just stand there? So, I actually don't march around with the keyboard as as much as I have dreamed of marching guitar <laughs> in my career. I don't think that's ever going to be a possibility. Um, so, unfortunately, <laughs> I have to get like a normal you know, like five octave keyboard and put it in a cart. And I actually don't march around. I just stand and play. But um, this, this setup for uh, how we did it is, has changed every so often. Mm. But um, most recently what we did is that I had a Roland FA-08 um, synthesizer and we had a computer in my synth cart that had main stage three on it. And the, basically my whole show was programmed into main stage and I had a keyboard and I had, you know, a monitor for sound. And so basically the, the role of the synthesizer is, um, you know, some of it can be like doubling horn parts um, for added effects, like just like string layers or like, you know, low subby bass if you want to get like a low yeah. impact. But, you know, a lot of what synth is used in shows are like transitions between movements or between like thematic ideas because we have a lot of samples that we have to go through mm. and um, the, the samples can be programmed onto the, onto the keyboard. And it's the, the, the difficulties of playing synth are more along the lines of making sure that none of like the electronic, you know, logistical things go wrong, you know, cause I, like my music has like a piano part, you know, honestly, like a lot of, a lot of piano players could probably play it. You know, it, it's, it's it, the piano part for, for, for drum corps, at least for Blue Devils, I can't speak for any other corps, but at least for Blue Devils, the book is not like ridiculously hard, you know. But the difficulty comes from the, the logistical side of setting up all the cabling for the show, and um, the, the samples that are really big, uh, like moments, you know. And you do that all individually. Yes, they're all they're all individually triggered. No, I'm saying like like you have to set up all your chords and everything. You don't have anybody help you. Oh no 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 no! We we have tons of help. We have the battery sta- staff come help us. We have like pa- like uh, volunteers. Like I was gonna say, damn, that's a lot. <laughs> yeah. There's like a yeah. There's like a whole operation. There's like a whole system. You know. There's like that we have. We last year we got these brand new um, speakers that are actually line arrays that stack on top of each other. Like you, if, if you ever go to like a, one of those big stadiums yeah. and you see the speakers hanging and like a J shape, we yeah. had like six of those on one cart. And that, that thing was heavy as heck, but you know, we, we, we really have been amping up the electronic in drum corps in general. Uh, amping. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. In drum corps, the whole electronic um, scene is just grow. It's just getting bigger, bigger every year. It's crazy. And, um, you know, yeah. So a lot of my difficulties as a synth player would be to just make sure that all that the show like transitions smoothly because, you know, 
like if you're a marcher and you you know miss your dot or you maybe get out of the form a little bit it's total it's a little okay to make a mistake mm-hmm. but as a synth player if you miss like a sample that's like a big moment or you you know if, if something turns off like like that happened to me once where my whole synth just turned off in the middle of the show you know and you got to figure out in the middle of the show what's going on you know uh so those are just some like minor difficulties Jeez. but like for synth that's that's basically what you, kind of signing up for the job would be a lot of logistical stuff so while we were talking about this i just looked up blue devil show and uh <laughs> So were you in uh, the 2016 show? I was. Well, I guess, I guess it doesn't even matter because I'm like looking at like the songs you're playing and like half of them are written by your dad. <laughs> yeah. So or, like he's at least in every show. Yeah. So so when I when I mentioned earlier that I had been playing my my dad's music throughout my entire career, that's kind of what I meant. Where I would play my dad's charts in middle school and high school, and then when I got to drum corps with marching band, I was like, okay, sweet, like I can finally like you know, enter, a, <laughs> an, escape. A, yeah, I can finally enter a world of music where my dad doesn't like know anything, you know? Cause like when my dad did marching band in high school, he like played clarinet for like a day and then, Oh, he did marching band. Yeah. He did. Yeah. He did marching band for a day. He played clarinet oh. <laughs> and he went to the first rehearsal and then he said he didn't like it. And then his mom wrote him an excuse that he was allergic to grass. So he didn't have to do Holy marching band. shit. <laughs> But he totally wasn't allergic to grass. So, bam. Jeez. I can. I got that. I got that. But yeah. So, but marching band was like that one area of music where I was like, this is like my thing. You know, this is like mine. I can call this my own. And then my first year at Blue Devils, they announced that Gordon Goodwin will be writing for the Blue Devils in 2016. <laughs> and then he did it. And then they wrote, he wrote for them again in. Actually, he first wrote that wrote for them in 14 and 15. But and yeah, then I 16 was his last year. But yeah. Wow. So he, he has written That's for them. So funny. And they did they like commission him to write it? Yeah, it was it was a it was like a commissioned type of thing. <laughs> they they were probably like, "Hey, we have Gordon's uh, son in our group. Man. You know, you know what he would love? Probably to play more of his dad's <laughs> music." Dad's music. <laughs> yeah, exactly, right? I mean, basically what they did was that, you know, they the at least in 14, I remember when they when they asked him to write, they were basically like, "You have no barriers. You can write literally whatever you want, and then we'll take it and we'll make it into like a drum core thing." Because my because my dad doesn't know how to write for like front ensemble, yeah. you know, and like marimba. Yeah. I mean, he, I mean, he could, he probably could, but like for for like a drum core sense, you know, he, he doesn't know the textures that you need to like, you know. Talk yeah, about. yeah, and like how how to yeah, he, and so basically he just wrote like a a a, a thirty two to sixty four bar idea, and sent them like a demo, and they took it and they picked the best one that they liked, and then they arranged it for drum core, and you know, those are the parts you see in fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. Mm. Or those those parts were were written by my dad. So earlier you were um, before we started, you said you wanted to talk about how um, jazz was played in um, mm, yeah the, the drum corps. Do you want to still elaborate on that? Yeah, um, I mean it was just like kind of like a, a personal thing where I, I've talked to my shout out to my friend um, Zach Hudson goes to MTSU, amazing drummer. Uh, he and I have, have had a lot of conversations about this um, where, you know, when you're in this, the drum corps world, you're kind of like enveloped in it for a long time, especially during the summer. And so you're around a lot of these people and like, oh, they'll, they'll name some parts of the show like the jazz hit. But like in actuality, yeah. you know, like really the only reason they're calling it the jazz hit is because the set player in the front ensemble went to his right symbol symbol and started going spang dang 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 gang 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 swing like king. you know right. yeah yeah jazz yeah swing swinking you know <laughs> um but like honestly i i think it just comes from like a like a, a difference in like foundation where like i think that jazz has the foundation of like you know of, of improv and you know spontaneity and you know learning on the fly and connecting like with music in the moment and drum core is like the co- it's like yeah. the complete opposite it's like reps on reps on reps on reps on like a repetition like do everything the exact same way every time so it's perfect yeah so you do it perfectly for the show you know and so though i think that like jazz does help drum corps like a lot of the most famous like drum corps moments are arranged jazz songs you know but i think to call it 
you know, I feel like it's like, I, I, I feel weird calling it jazz to me, you know, cause I don't, I, I feel like it's drum core jazz, you know, I feel like those are two separate identities, at least to me, you know, that's how I like separate. I, it. I agree too. I mean, like, uh, I mean, it really does take like the aspect out of jazz that I think is the most important, which is the spontaneity or spontaneity, whatever. And spontaneity, like, yeah. improvisation. I mean, like so some of my favorite, I mean, of course, they're my fucking favorite shows because Blue Devils did uh, a Don Ellis portrait, and then I, gosh, oh, uh, Madison show. Scouts did a Don Ellis show, mm-hmm. and it's like, you know, hell yeah, I love it, yeah. but it's also, it's more about, like, power, but, well, the Madison Scouts one actually looked like they sort of improvised the lead trumpet players, but, like, mm-hmm. you know, it's it's still not, it's it's drum corps, it's yeah. not jazz, it's just drum corps, and it's like, wow, that's just yeah. so cool, that's so cool, but it's like, you know, it's not like they thought of that right on the, the spot, they freaking did it three million times. Yeah, and, you know, even... Even like I have, I have personal experience um, getting a chance to improvise for um, indoor because my my first season of like WG Winter Guard International Indoor Drumline, the, the beginning of our closer for uh, Riverside Community College, our closer started with an improv solo from me and a trumpet player, so it was kind mm-hmm. of like a, a duet type of thing, and so mm-hmm. the the duet between me and the trumpet player was very improv and it was very jazz centric. And, you know, I, I think you can have those elements of jazz in there, you know, and you can have somebody improv and soloing and you can have, you know, the same type of, you know, corporation or whatever, whatever you think makes jazz jazz. But in drum corps, the way that it is packaged and the way that it is delivered, I think is the, like kind of the defining factor. Cause it's like, it's on a football field with like angles and grids and not on like a, casual cool dark jazz bandstand you know yeah it's definitely like two different feelings <laughs> that come with that presentation it's more just raw power instead of yeah instead of feeling. like you know finesse and you know maybe yeah. not playing super fortissimo all the time yeah sounds like my jazz band <laughs> i have just one more question before we close up um i was just curious because I, I consider your your father to be, you know, very successful and, like, very well known. Do people, like, when they, like, hear your name or whatever, like, any, and I'm not talking about just, like, in music, but, like, just anywhere, do people be like, oh, are you Gordon Goodwin's son? Do you ever get that? Um, in, in like, very music-centered um, events, yeah. Like, I remember when I went to Idlewild, uh, jazz summer camp in going from seventh grade to eighth grade and I, and I had my first piano lesson with the professor there that was running the piano students and the very first thing when he called my name and he asked me my last name I said Goodwin and he said any relation to Gordon and I, and I said yeah and then you know the next day it like that was kind of like my experience at Idlewild was um, I was known as I like I was kind of known as like Gordon Goodwin's son you know, that's how they knew mm. me. And like a lot of my first impressions would be exactly that, you know? And so it's, uh, it was, it was always kind of expected. I'm like, I'm a little more used to it now, you know, Yeah. where people like, like I, there haven't been a, like a whole lot of times this has happened, but there, there have been times where someone is like, like a really, really like big fan of my dad. You know, and like my, my, my chemistry teacher in high school played trombone. And when he realized who my dad was, he, in, in the middle of class, he ran to his drawer and opened it and pulled out every single one of my dad's CDs. He like kept them in his drawer in his classroom. And I was take, I, I just happened to get his class myself. Jeez, that's kind of creepy. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah, yeah, it, it was, it was like, it's crazy. So, so sometimes I think it's a little more broad than, than I, I think it is, but I, you know, there are definitely have been. Do you ever just want to like where... lie and be like, no, I don't know who that is. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I mean, you know, there, there have been sometimes where I've gotten really tired of having to, to have the same conversation, yeah. you know, about, about my dad. But I, you know, like I would never say, I wish I had like a, you know, a different dad or anything. Cause, cause you know, I, I love my dad like through and through oh yeah he's, he's done so much totally for me, yeah. you know and like yeah obviously 
but you know, I, I, but like, I totally would get tired of having to do that same introduction. Like that every year of Blue Devils, when I was a rookie, one of the first week I was there, like a hundred and like thirty people, because you all you you all meet a ton of people for the first time in drum yeah. corps. So a hundred thirty times for like the first week of drum corps, my rookie year was like, hi. Yes, I'm Gordon Goodwin's son. Hi. Yes, I'm Gordon Goodwin's son. No, he doesn't make me practice every night for three hours. No, he, you know, stuff like that. (laughs) No, he makes me listen to, makes me listen to CDs and says, who is this? (laughs) Is is it me? I don't know. He he controls every, every playlist I have. If, if Jazz Police is not on every other (laughs) track in my play, in my playlist, he deletes them. What's your dad's favorite song of his own? Does he have one? Ooh, I don't know. I, I I guess I've I've probably asked him that before. Do you know if he has a least favorite? Where he's like, ah man, maybe I shouldn't have recorded that one. <laughs> a least favorite one? Ooh, um, at least I I know I, if I had to say his most favorite one, um, he loves um, George Gershwin. Yeah, he, mm-hmm. he's like a super fanboy of him, and he's also a huge fanboy of John Williams. I also need to. Make sure I, I, I preface that. My, my dad is an absolute nerd over John it Williams, makes which sense. I think is hilarious. Yeah, it does make sense. But, um, Disney jazz. He, mm. Yeah, Disney jazz and all that stuff. I think my dad's favorite chart would probably be that Rhapsody in Blue chart. Um, I knew it. Uh, that's what I was going to guess. Yeah, I mean, it's my favorite too. I feel like it's everyone's favorite for like a lot of reasons. Mm-hmm. You know, just because, you know, he has a Christmas album for Bah Humduck for Looney Tunes. I was I was gonna say like, man, I, you know, it's always sucks when someone's like, oh, that's your dad. Wow, you're his son. You're his son. But I was like, wait, we're kind of doing that same thing. I'm yeah, sorry. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody has ever been able to not do it, even when they even when they they realize it like you did, where they're like, they're like, oh man, like you must be so annoying having someone ask you. Are you going to sun every day? And, I'm, and they're like, "Oh my god, I just did it! I'm so sorry." And it's like, "Oh, it's fine," you know. Like, it like I don't feel like there's any harm in 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 asking it, you know. I you know, it's just when that that becomes like the whole like basis or like in reason for knowing me, you know. Mm, yeah, I remember um, when I for, when you I don't remember. I, I talked to you like briefly when you joined the page, but it was funny because before you joined, there was like another guy named Goodwin. And then there was a guy named Jordan Goodwin and we always made fun of them. <laughs> and then, and then you, you came along and we're like, Oh, another good one. And then someone's like, this is the real guy. And we're like, no shit. Oh no. <laughs> like, cool. Oh, did, did you, did you guys not know when I, when I, I mean, when I entered the, the group, I was like, I wonder if they're going to ask if, I wonder if they're going to like realize like who it is. And I'll be like, eh, maybe not. I don't know. There's like, there's like a ton of people in this group. They probably won't see it. Oh, I, I just know so many people now, but, um, yeah, I, I hope we, <laughs> this wasn't a negative experience. Oh no. I had a great time. I was more excited. I was like, oh, okay, cool, the Goodwin boy. But then when I was like, holy shit, he's in Blue Devils. I mean, for me, I was like, wow, that's that's crazy. I, I just really like Core. I'm getting even more into it. Although I am I used to be a Blue Devils boy because, of course, the trumpet section. Um, uh-huh, you know. yeah. But um, I right now it's Carolina Crown because I, oh, their horn section is amazing. But anyway, that's my small little gush. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, yeah, totally. The crown's crown's horn section is is not to be messed with, except when we accidentally steal their hammer, or not accidentally. You stole their hammer? Well, I didn't steal their hammer. But someone. Uh, so Ooh. there's there was like this. So yeah, we're we're getting to some drum core drama. Bum, 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 you know. <laughs> super super. Yeah. Uh. So they're the the crown brass has this hammer. They have a literal hammer that says yeah. crown brass on it. And it's like a, it's a tradition to be like a, a, like a staple kind of like artifact in their, uh, group. And, um, somebody from Blue Devils stole, it's kind of like a running joke to like steal things from other cores. Like I'm pretty sure Blue Coat stole something, stole a prop from Crown and, you know, Vanguard stole a prop from, from Blue Coats yeah. and like mm-hmm. all that stuff, you know, like, the, like that's like a common thing that happens 
that like cores do to each other. And you know, I'm not advocating like stealing <laughs> from other people, obviously. But but this is this was different because they posted a <laughs> this picture. This was different. It was justified. Yeah, because be, no, this was okay. Well, this wasn't justified. This was, in fact, this was like the opposite of that, where the the the, the members who stole the crown hammer took a picture of them like licking the hammer in uniform Ooh. and covering the br in brass. So instead of saying crown brass, it says crown ass oh, no. on Classic. the hammer, and and they 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 took a picture like a bunch of freaking idiots in uniform that hurts and then, me and, and in uniform in the hotel room we're staying at like could okay like if you're gonna be dumb and take the picture like why would you do it in the hotel room where it is clear like that's where every like blue devil is staying like and if you're gonna take it in the uniform like that's that's a dumb idea on its own taking the picture let's 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 be honest about that but um that 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 picture um leaked online eventually it just got spread around so much and it caught it caused an entire facebook group full of like a a couple thousand drum corps people to just to just instantly vanish oh my god it was just that was just that picture yeah that picture has caused like a lot of drama but you know it's i i'm aged out i'm i'm all i'm done i'm out i'm all good i i'm all aged out of drum corps i'm 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 22 now i don't have to i don't have to worry about who stole what prop from where and i can just enjoy a free summer but then feel except, sad except except your father's marching. gonna still force you to listen to his music you're gonna he's gonna work around some way it's like oh he's at a drum corps well <laughs> stop playing my music somehow who is it is it me <laughs> is it is it you is it you are you <laughs> i'm sure i'm sure i'll start writing so uh, well we gotta start wrapping up um i always like to give some time uh if you have any advice for any Life, music, dad, anything. Uh, now is your chance to just give some small advice you think would be helpful for all of our two listeners. No, this one will get this one will get bigger. The interviews get bigger ones. To all the all the f- four people listening, you know, I just really want to say, no, I'm just joking. <laughs> um, I guess if I had any advice to, um, I guess just like musicians in general, um something that like I've thought about before is the phrase that like you can give up on music. You can, you can give up on music, but I like, I feel, I feel like it's almost impossible for music to, to give up on you in a sense, you know, like music will always be there for you. Like it, no one's going to just stop making music all of a sudden, you know? And I think there's a lot of pressure in today of like, you know, having to have the most qualities possible or having having the most tools under your belt to be the most advertised, the most like, you know, qualified out of everybody to be able to do that, you know, and that's that's all well and good. But I, I want to support, I want to push the, the idea that, you know, like your your mental health and like your your journey with music, you know, has ups and downs, you know, and there's there, there will be times where you'll hit valleys and lows but i've always found that you know i've i've given up on music a lot of times i've given up on music multiple times thinking i it's something i can never do but i always come back to it because i believe that it's 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 always going to be there and so you know i i think if i could give any advice it would just be to to remember that you know music will never give up on you and it's okay to take a break it's okay to to focus on yourself you know it's not the end of the world a good one this is very snap, inspirational. Snap, snap, I really like that. Thank you. I'm glad. Yeah, thank you. I'm I'm glad I can. Uh, thank you for letting me come and and just talk. I, if you guys haven't noticed, I, I really like to to talk. But it, this has been so much fun. Yeah, I'm glad that we could finally make it happen. We've had some issues <laughs> trying to get this <laughs> thing After started. This yeah, two third times the charm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, as long as it happens. Exactly. A lot, and, and it gets released. It will. It will. Especially once I graduate and I have more time to spend on the podcast and just talk to people in general. Nice. Um, well, I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. Well, uh, do you have any, any stuff you want to shout out? Any anyone or any music or anything? Uh, again, shout out to Zach, my, my friend at MTSU. Uh, shout out to Michael, Alan, uh, Whitney, Vanessa, all my all my Blue Devil people, you know who you are. Um, 
I want to give a shout out to all of the homies in Long Beach. Um, a long time ago, I went and auditioned for Cal State Long Beach, and uh, the, the 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 people over there are like super great. Like they they're like super supportive. And I had like a really stressful audition day and I was like not handling very well, but they were like super supportive and they like helped me out. And I've always wanted to find a way to give back. So this is how, this is how I'm doing it. Shout out to the Long Beach uh, Jazz Department because they're, they're, some, some of the people in there are really nice. Mm. Um, I, have, I have a YouTube video. Um, well, it's not on my channel because I don't have a channel. But uh, I do have a performance of me playing Kenny Barron's version of Someday My Prince Will Come. Uh, uh, for IE last summer. So if you want to see me play, go check out uh, that it's video. It's really good. I watched um, it. I enjoyed it a lot. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I, I, I transcribed that uh, myself and I spent a lot of time on that. I'm really, I'm really happy with the way that one turned out. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at uh, Git Goodwin. <laughs> uh, oh, thank you. I came, as a, as a yeah, Dark Souls you. fan, I especially love that. Oh, I love Dark Souls too. All right, we, we got to talk about oh, that yes. after, after we're done with this. But yeah, you can, you can follow me on Twitter at Git Goodwin. Um, Facebook is Garrison Goodwin. Instagram is Garrison underscore slash Gare Bear if you care about that. But um, <laughs> yeah, thanks, thanks for listening to me talk at you guys for so long. It was really, really cool to be able to do this. So thank you again. Anytime. Yeah, man. thanks for coming on. All right. Of course. Well, this has been the Woodshed Podcast with uh, myself, Andy Brent, uh, Race, and Garrison Goodwin. Uh, mm. I can't wait to see you guys in the next episode. We'll start getting releases out uh, more quickly. I am almost graduated, so I'll have a lot more time to spend, and I'll be able to edit stuff myself, so I'm very excited for that. Um, keep playing. Music will never give up on you. Remember that wise words of Garrison Goodwin. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. See ya.